I'm going to talk about a very scary symptom, acute chest pain. Something that can happen any time of the day and get you rushing to the emergency room by whatever means necessary, maybe perhaps even by helicopter. In fact, this happens six million times a year throughout the United States, costing the healthcare system over $15 billion to take care of this single diagnosis. And most of the money really spent on making sure that you're not having a heart attack. And can we do something better to improve this process? Can we save money and save the pain that the patient has to go through for this very uncomfortable condition? But well, before we go there, let's talk about what is acute chest pain, or the medical term angina. It is pain that spread from the chin to the belly button. It can radiate or travel to the shoulder, to the back. It's very unpredictable. There are other life-threatening causes of chest pain, equal, equally deadly. One is acute pulmonary embolism blood clots in the lung. The other one is rupture of the main vessel in your chest or aortic dissection. These are all chest pain. How can you distinguish one from another? There are also many, many chest pain that are completely pretty benign. Gas pain, indigestion, pinched nerve, muscle soreness, to name just a few. How can you distinguish one from another? How do you know which one you need to go to the emergency room, which one you don't? The short answer is that you can't tell. And that's why the six million ER visit a year. I remember the process that we evaluate patients when they come into the emergency room with chest pain. This has been going on for over 20 some years. I still remember vividly the case that I took care of when I was a student. A 40-some-year-old businessman came into the emergency room, middle of the night, woke up with chest pain. He thought he was having a heart attack. So we immediately escorted him into the emergency room, put him on a stretcher. We did blood tests. We did EKG. In fact, we did it again and again. We kept him on a stretcher in a busy emergency room right next to many, many other sick patients. And we kept him there for hours. And after about 12, 13 hours, he said, my pain is gone. I want to go home. I said, you can. We haven't done yet. We need more blood tests. He decided to sign out against medical advice. And I told him not to do that. He said, well, I'm fine, I'm going home. So as I was preparing the paper, the last blood test came back that showed that he's having a heart attack. So I told him that, no, you can't go home. So we, he turned around, we admitted him to the coronary care unit, and he subsequently had a procedure that opened the blockage in, in, in one of his main coronaries. So this scenario happened again and again for the past 20-some years throughout the United States. What is a heart attack? We need to understand that process in order to make a difference, to change the process that we evaluate this deadly condition. Heart attack basically is a result of plaque buildup in your heart vessel over a period of decades. It's very unpredictable who's going to get it early and who's not going to get it late. We have seen young in the 20s get heart attack. And we have seen 80-some-year-old grandma with clean coronary. Go figure. The short answer is you cannot tell just by judging the look of an individual. You need something more advanced. And when you have a heart attack, that's the end of the disease buildup. 
is like a volcano rupture and sudden stoppage of blood going down to the muscle. That's what you're feeling. You're feeling the pain of the muscle dying. And that's why we are doing blood tests. We're doing EKG to detect any electrical instability going on in your heart. If you survive the ordeal of waiting in the emergency room for 14 hours, you think that that's the end. Well, you haven't seen the second act yet. Basically, what the blood tests and EKG have done is that you are not having a heart attack, but that doesn't mean that you are not going to have one within the next few days or months. So oftentimes, you need to go through the second level of tests. And the two that we often execute, one is stress test, the other one is invasive coronary angiography. They are performed to make sure that you're not going to have a heart attack in the near future. Well, a lot of hospitals decided to not to do the stress test. They just ask you to go see your doctor within the next three days. To me, that's like playing Russian roulette. And there's some hospital would do angiogram to just make sure that it's okay. So many patients went through that invasive, potentially deadly procedure for nothing. So there got to be a better way to do this. And these two tests only turn positive if you have severe lesion. And they completely ignore a whole group of patients with early and mild disease, which I think is a missed opportunity. And we need to do better than that. Well, at Stony Brook, since I came here five years ago, we pioneered a whole new approach. We said that the standard of care is time-consuming, costly, inaccurate, and oftentimes patients sent home with a false sense of security, that there's nothing wrong with the heart. That's far from the truth. As I've shown you in the cartoon before, many patients with early disease has, have to do something about it. We cannot miss this golden opportunity. So what is this new strategy? It involves a modern technology, a CAT scanner, that can freeze the motion of a beating heart. For the first time, we can get a picture of the heart and a blood vessel in less than one second. That change make a big difference in terms of what we can and cannot do. So for the past five years, we've been using this approach to evaluate patients. Just look at this cartoon. The difference with CAT scan is that we see the entire spectrum of disease, of the entire spectrum of the plaque buildup process. We have a lot of patients with normal disease to go home and feel safe, and they don't have to come back. And more importantly, we help those patients with mild to moderate disease to recognize that, that they need to do something with their lifestyle, and perhaps they need to work with the doctor to modify the risk factor. Are they sedentary? Are they smoking too much? Is the blood sugar too high? Is the cholesterol too high? All these things need to modify once you know that you have early signs of plaque buildup. To me, that is the most important piece of information we could gather from this technology. Furthermore, this test is not only for the heart. We could detect the other two deadly conditions that I talk about. Pulmonary embolism, no problem. We pick that up right away. Or the rupture of the blood vessel, we do that equally well. And for those with clean coronary, no problem with the lung and the, and the aorta, they can be sent home. Rest assured that nothing's going to happen within the next six months. That's a pretty good warranty period for a diagnostic test in the emergency room. So our data basically have shown that this 
test is equally effective from infant to the elderly. And we have shown that it is equally effective for women with small coronary vessels who are able to detect the subtle changes just as well. And many patients who are morbidly obese oftentimes need to be admitted. Now we can use the CAT scanner and see the same thing. And we can make a diagnosis equally well in this group of patients. So our data so far have been quite convincing that this is the most accurate and definitive way of evaluating someone with acute chest pain. We dramatically reduced the unnecessary hospital admission from over 40% to below 10. And we also dramatically shortened the length of stay in the emergency room from over 14 hour to less than six. So you don't need to have this painful, long waiting period in the emergency room. Once the scan is complete, if it's negative, you go home. And you don't have the false sense of security either. By knowing what you have, we found that most of the patients don't even come back to the emergency room anymore. The recidivism rate dropped dramatically. Well, what can we do better? Well, there's disruptive innovation, something that we all aspire to achieve. What is disruptive innovation? Basically, innovation that's going to disrupt the status quo for the betterment of the future. So you want to disrupt whatever people feel comfortable doing because that's not the right thing. It's outdated. Well, we ask a very simple question. Can we offer this service to another hospital that does not have the capability, the resources, yet can perform and offer the same beneficial service to the patient who live around that area? Well, the simple answer to this question is a resounding yes. We have done that. For the past two years, we've been working with J.T. Mather Memorial Hospital, which is about eight miles from here. We helped to train the, the staff. We remotely helped them to scan the patient. We remotely interpret the study for them, and the patient can be sent home from the hospital immediately afterward. And our data show that we are achieving the same outstanding outcomes. 80% of the patient can be sent home right away from the emergency room. No more painful waiting in the emergency room, hours to end. And those patients with disease, we detect them right away and transfer them back to Stony Brook for further advanced treatment. It's a win-win situation for everybody. And we also found that the image quality, even performed remotely, are just as good. We have no non-diagnostic images because the physician is actually involved with the data acquisition, which also further reduce the radiation dose exposure and the technician feel a lot more at ease that they are now have a physician helping them to get good quality data. So there's no downside to this disruptive innovative idea. Well, I hope in the past 15 minutes or so, I was able to convince you that we have now developed a way to evaluate this condition more effectively. Acute chest pain is no longer a lengthy, painful, costly emergency room visit because we have a way to make a diagnosis accurately. And from a population health standpoint, I think this is the most exciting part of this work that I just mentioned to you. We're able to identify an entire group of patients in the past or even in the present for those patients who went to other hospitals besides Stony Brook and JT Matter, they all got sent home with this false sense of security, that there's nothing wrong with their heart. 
this group of patients with mild and moderate disease, we're going to make a difference in their life. We're going to change the natural history of the disease process. And I believe in the long run, we will save many, many unnecessary heart attack and sudden death. So this imaging technique is transformative, is safe, is cost effective. It also reduces the crowding in the emergency room. Nobody wants to walk into a crowded emergency room, and certainly you don't want to wait there for nothing. The standard of care approach is time consuming and not accurate. And using the advanced information technology and telemedicine, I believe that we can disseminate this expertise to other hospitals, both locally and nationally. We need to share this because I think that's the only way that disruptive innovation can ultimately reduce the cost of healthcare so that other new technology can come out to benefit more people. If we keep doing the same outdated things, we're not going to advance by saving money from outdated procedure and intervention. That's how we make room for new technologies. With that, I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you.